Right, uh, let's start things off, shall we? So uh, firstly, just want to say welcome. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I really hope that you find this informative and that we're able to address as many questions uh, as we can. Uh, there is a Q&A function. So if you have any questions to go through, please feel free to, to write them in that and we'll see them. And we'll have some time at the end to go through as many as we can. Um, Obviously, we won't be able to answer everyone's questions, but uh, we'll be sure to answer them on our website uh, later on, and we'll give you details about that at the end. Um, so just to start off, uh, to introduce myself, uh, my name's Alice. I'm going to be hosting this evening. Uh, I'm the Group Communications Manager for Barrett Developments, PLC. I've been with Barrett now for three years. Um, I was initially working in the London team and have recently moved across the group. So I'd like to start by introducing our panel. Uh, we have an excellent panel uh, today. Uh, really pleased to have everyone here. Thank you for joining. Uh, so to start with, um, I'll introduce Anne, Anne Ashworth, um, who is waving at you. <laughs> it's, um, a really well-renowned property and finance writer, um, obviously a regular on the BBC News and probably most recently known for being the former award-winning editor of The Times, Bricks and Water and Money Supplements. And then we have Rachel, if you want to give a wave. Uh, Rachel Geddes, she is um, our mortgage specialist today. So she's business principal at the award-winning Mortgage Advice Bureau, and also one of the founders of the London arm of their business. Um, so hopefully lots of useful information there is for you all. Um, and then Mark, Mark Van Grinder. So Mark joins us from uh, Benham and Reeves, where he's a director, um, and that's one of these uh, one of Central London's oldest independent lettings agents, which is based in Hampstead. So lots of letting questions we are directing at Mark tonight. And then uh, Jen Siebritz, um, who is the Executive Director and Head of UK Research at CBRE, which I'm sure you know, um, the world's largest commercial real estate and investment firm. And then finally, our very own Ed McCoy, uh, who is Sales Director at Barrett London, uh, looking after our website side of the business in particular. Um, so an excellent panel for you and uh, I think we can kick off with some questions so let's get started. Um, obviously thank you to everyone who sent in questions in advance. We had a lot come through uh, which is excellent and one of the big topics I'd like to start with uh, which we had a lot of questions on was big hotspots in London. Uh, so to begin with I think I'll actually go to you Anne. Um, in your opinion, where do you see the next big hotspot being? And if you were to invest in London, where would you buy? Now, that is a very interesting question at any time. But now it would seem to me that the automatic answer and the most obvious answer would be in leafier suburbs where there are all the things that we've learned to love so much, like parks and places where we can just take a stroll and where houses typically tend to have larger gardens and there is a sort of village atmosphere. I think a lot of London villages have almost been reborn during this period. A lot of London high streets have become more vibrant places than they were before. Now if I was thinking about buying in London I wouldn't necessarily be guided by thinking this is the new hotspot. I would always think at any time, is it the place that suits you? And my one observation here would be, do not assume you will never go, be going back to the office because I sense that when the return to the office comes, it will come faster than we thought. And it would be a really good idea to check whether it's a commute that you would be happy to do on a miserable November night. Just just saying, because it may be two or three days, you're back in the office. So I would just, I whenever I've moved, I've never, I've always checked the commute first. And I think that still makes sense. Definitely, that's definitely on a lot of people's minds. So that's a really, really good point to raise actually. Um, so on that then, Jen, uh, perhaps I, I could come to you next on your thoughts on this. Are there any areas in London that you're seeing big growth of places to watch? Yeah, I mean, I, I would add, I mean, I agree with everything that Anne has said. One of the things I would add though, is if you're buying particularly as an investment rather than somewhere to live yourself, you might want to look at say regeneration zones. You know, we know from our previous research that properties in regeneration zones go up by more than the borough average. 
So that might be a, a nice way in, particularly, you know, perhaps for a first time buyer, you might buy in a, at an entry level in a regeneration zone with the knowledge that over the next th three or four years, the area will become a new area, you know, particularly if you, you know, you may have some you know, financial constraints and you can't buy into the area that you particularly want to live in, but, you know, you might buy an area, you know, in a peripheral zone. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so thinking about those big regeneration areas, are there any in particular that stand out that you've seen um, growth or that you think it wants to watch? Well, I mean, the ones that we've looked at really are regeneration zones that have happened because, of course, we've looked at because we've had to analyze the price. But I think really, you know, as, as answers, anywhere with a good commute, you know, and a lot of these regeneration zones, they're overlooked, but they've got such short commute times into the center of London. Um, so, you know, anywhere with a good commute um, and anywhere that, you know, again, has a buzz and has a vibrancy. Look at the master plan. Look at what is going in and look at the local shops. You know, all of these things, if you get a decent feel for an area then that's somewhere to plump to buy. Thank you, that's really helpful. And actually, I think that probably leads on nicely. Um, Ed, if there's anything that springs to mind from those, those sorts of areas, the things we've been talking about, the commuting time, the shops that are gonna go in the green spaces, is there anything that springs to mind from a Barrett London perspective that you wanted to mention? Oh, I'd really echo Jen's comments really around, you know, look for regeneration hotspots. Often, um, clearly, there's going to be substantial investment in the area from both the public and private sectors. That's why it's a regeneration area. And therefore, you know, as an investor, you might be motivated by firstly being, out, being able to have high demand for rental property. And, you know, young professionals are going to want to move into these areas that are regenerating. But secondly, one of the main motivators might be that you're looking for increased capital growth. And that's what you absolutely get in a regeneration area. So... Um, you know, some, some of the sites where, you know, where we've got developments such as, you know, Hendon or Eastman Village in um, Harrow, we, we're developing massive, massive um, projects of over 2,000 units and capital growth is, is significant from the first day that we laid the kind of the first brick to the, to the last completion. So I definitely focus on a regeneration area. Perfect. Great. Well, um, Moving on to a different topic uh, now, one of uh, one of the topics which is a real hot topic on our questions that we got through was mortgages. So I'm going to come to you, Rachel, our wonderful mortgage specialist. Um, so hopefully just a couple of relatively quick questions to start with um, that have come through. The first one is um, the question of whether lenders in the UK offer mortgage financing to overseas buyers. Yes, there's still quite a few lenders that are offering this. And it's always been a large market in London anyway. And we see more lenders return to that market over the last three to five months as well. So really buoyant market at the moment. Okay, that's really good to know. And uh, an another question we've had through, again, hopefully relatively quick to answer, is um, whether you can buy property in your child's name. And if so, how old they would need to be? Yes, yeah, so there's a few different ways and structures of doing it. Um, from a standard lending point of view would be ages of 18 or 21 on most occasions. However, you also do have the ability to buy in family trusts or in limited companies where it gives you the ability to add people of any ages into that. Uh, so there's lots of ways of doing it depending on the state planning and so on, which is a long conversation, but lots of ways to do it. That's good, thank you. Um, so actually, while we're here, um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more broadly something about the buy to let mortgage availability at the minute. How, how is the market doing? How is buy to let mortgage availability? It's really, really strong. Um, obviously, over the last 12 months, we've seen quite a few changes happen with the pandemic. But a lot more lenders, especially your mainstream high street lenders, have come back to that arena. Um, and we're seeing some really competitive products and rates coming out. So although maybe between April and June last year, there was across from all lending, um, few hurdles and hindrances. However, we've seen more and more want to get back into that arena, offering the rates, and we're seeing more clientele coming through for it as well. Our buy to application for lenders has increased near double in the last six months. Actually, can I just, can I just add on that? It's Please quite do. Interesting. It's, it's quite interesting on buy to let, because obviously we're a lettings business. So we've actually seen though, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were real delays in getting, in getting people out to do valuations. I've had over the last month, we've had four separate clients tell me they've all remortgaged with different people and every single one of them has done a desktop valuation. On, that's on a remortgage. I'm not saying on a new one. And that's quite encouraging because I think 
before the pandemic, you couldn't get a bank to do a remortgage, to do a remortgage on, a, on, a, on a desktop. Whereas, de you know, maybe you want to explain what a desktop is, but that's really helpful. I mean, it's certainly helpful for us. Yes, and we see it on the purchases as well. So desktop valuation is, rather than coming out to value the property from a rental and uh, market value point of view, is actually just taking the comparables that are available online. Um, and actually, as Mark has rightly said, pre-pandemic, it was unheard of. There's very few lenders who would consider it where over 70% of lenders' applications on the mainstream um, are actually trying to do desktops. It's just the way the world. So it has been really good to see technology move forward and surveyors and lenders working together to enable these things to happen quicker, but also go through. Brilliant, that is really encouraging. Um, so then just thinking about the, the rental market in, in general then in London, Mark, again, um, I've, had, I've had quite an easy question through, which I'm hoping you can answer, and then, and then we'll move on to some of the trickier ones. And I thought the question is uh, whether it is better to rent a furnished or a non-furnished apartment, or whether it's an entirely subjective question. Okay, that's, that's a great question. So the way that we look at it is, is actually it makes no difference to the amount of rent you get. It all depends on who your tenant is and, and your demographic that you're looking at. So if you're buying a studio or a one bedroom flat, which, much, which is what most investors drive towards, generally speaking, single people or couples who are renting those kind of slightly smaller units, they generally will come with nothing. So they generally have no furniture at all. So you would need to furnish that. And the client that comes to us and says, I'll furnish it when I get an offer, the problem is in a development where you might have 20, 30, 50 units completing, your unit, people have very little imagination of what a, what a property looks like when it's just bare walls. And so you need to furnish to encourage them to rent. So smaller units, studios, one bedrooms, and to be fair, most two bedrooms, 70% of the two bedrooms that we rent are rented furnished, 90, I think it's almost 100% of studios rent furnished, sorry. 90% uh, of one bedrooms let furnished and about 70% of two bedrooms let furnished. So my, my advice to anybody is make sure the moment that the developer serves notice on you, you've got your furnishings ready to go, you complete, you collect your keys, you go in and get your furniture in there. Your curtains can come a few days later because that will let quicker. If you wait and you delay that's when you end up with, 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 with lengthening times. Larger properties, I'd leave them unfurnished, but for smaller ones, you should definitely furnish and you don't get any more money. It's just about letting it. That is really interesting. Do you know that's not something I'd ever even considered. <laughs> You've done something new every day. Um, so just looking at, looking at the rental market in London in general, uh, one of the big questions that we've been having through is just looking at over the next two years how everything's going to develop whether that's the rental market or whether that's the general property market across London so perhaps if we, if we stay on the topic of rental Mark do you, do you have anything to to add to the conversation of how it's going to develop? I, I mean in terms of how it's going to develop my it's interesting why everyone's talking about regeneration zones so what we've seen as a business so so last year we did the same number of lets almost within within about 50 of the same number of lets we did last year that we did in 2019. So almost the same volume. The difference was, is the demand was slightly further out. So in the kind of zone three, zone four, zone five is where people have moved to. And there's been a massive jump in people moving further out. What, what I'm seeing as a prediction gonna come, uh, and, and prices have been, have been challenging. We've seen rent reductions of anywhere from seven to 15% rent corrections where, where rents have come off because you've had two key major factors that have happened during the pandemic. Number one, restriction on travel. So all of those people that would have come in and stayed in Airbnb, short-term accommodation while they're in London on a short trip or holiday trip, finished, finished. So all of that property has been stuck onto the long-term rental market and that's meant there's more stock for rentals. So it puts a pressure on prices. Number two, overseas students. So very, very few overseas students have come in over the last, over the last from the July period. There were, there were literally, we had a 90% drop in students renting from us in, the, in that key period because they stayed in their own countries, they didn't come. And so that's meant there's been excess supply 
reduced demand. And so those two factors have met, have caused the downward pressure on rents in, in, in the prime areas, in addition to people moving further out. So people renting in the prime areas have done very well. You can get incredible rental deals. Echoing what Anne said about commuting, lots of people are working from home. So they think, oh, I want to get a little garden and I want to get a terrace and I'm going to move further out. And a lot of people have moved out of London. They've actually physically moved down whether they bought or rented. We're predicting with, with, with universities reopening and with the, the travel market starting to reopen, look at where the vaccine rollout is happening now and travel starting looking like third quarter to be relaxed. We're seeing there will be, and, and the third point to add to that is that you've got companies, Goldman Sachs being the prime one that just came out last week and said, when this is over, we don't want anybody working from home. Everybody's gonna work from the office. I've had that echoed from three of the largest law firms we've worked for, two other banks, and uh, two oil companies, oil slash insurance companies that we work with. They've all echoed, they're not gonna have people working from home. They want them to come in, unless it's a tech role and they were working from home. Those factors together, we think, is going to cause a huge surge in demand in the, in the London rental market. Because people, as Anne said, if someone's moved out to a lovely village and they're renting, and all of a sudden they've got a bit more space, they're paying a little less rent, but all of a sudden their commute into central London is going to cost them £5,000 a year, as opposed to £2,000 on the tube, that, where's that money going to come from? So I think you're going to see people moving back in, and I think you'll have the demand. So, so we see there's going to be a boom. So in terms of where the rental market's going, we think quarter four, quarter three will be in demand from students, but quarter four and quarter one, 2022, we'll, we, we see a mini boom coming. So I don't see any demographic shift in terms of people don't want to live in one area than another. I just think it's a reversal of what we've seen over during pandemic as people move back in. And I'm not saying back into prime center, I'm talking about, from outside back in, I think a, rev a partial reversal of what's happened in the country market. I see, yeah. That's my quick take, sorry. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, that's really helpful. Um, so if then I, if we, sorry, Jen, please. I if, I, if I can add to that, I mean, we've always had migration out of London when people start having children and they, you know, they want to move out, they want more space, they want schools. So there's always been the outflow. What we haven't seen this year is we haven't seen the inflow as you're saying, from young professionals starting their jobs, you know, graduates and, and students, etc. So that's why it seems that, you know, then there's the horror stories about, you know, the death of London and, you know, 700,000 fewer people living there. It's big, you know, as you say, we've had families have, you know, brought their decisions forward so that might have moved out next year or the year after, have all kind of compressed into one year, and we haven't had the inflows of young professionals. And I absolutely agree that we will see people return as the office reopens don't agree so much that it's going to be such a cut and dry people going back to the office. I think it's going to be much more of a hybrid where people are back three or four days, um, which quite, which was more in line with before COVID anyway. Um, but I do think that there is going to be demand and people are going to want to live back in, you know, back near to the office, um, but, you know, and all of the things that have been driving people towards London, you know, is going to return. I mean, as you say, who wants to pay the privilege to be near an office and to be near the pubs and clubs when the office is shut and the pubs and clubs are shut as well. So again, I think come June, we're going to see this pick up. And you know, even Rightmove and other search portals data is showing now that there's been a huge surge in searches for zone one and two, both properties to buy and to rent. That's really useful. And did you have anything else to add on to that? I know we've covered a, a bit of everything there. Can I just say I'm hugely cheered by what my other panelists are saying. There is, I can feel this real confidence in the resurgence of London. And we know that history shows that this is a city that comes back and comes back bigger from all the things that have afflicted it in history. And also, I think maybe this is the try before you buy moment in London. If you've always rented and you've never lived in a, in a certain area, hell, why not go and move rent there for a while to see if that is the place that you would actually like to put down roots and it might be a surprising it might be a surprising place a place where you never thought of living this is the time i think to have a good time with where, uh, with where you live and maybe allow yourself to try a certain number of zones before you go find the one that suits you 
That is a great idea. That's great advice, actually, for anyone who's looking to move in. So, so then if we if we through, if we think, okay, there's there could be a resurgence. We're looking at a boom. Um, how, one of the questions we've had is about property prices, which I'm sure everyone was expecting. Um, how do we see those developing? Is there anyone who would like to take that question? I think this is Jeanette first. <laughs> I don't mind taking that. I mean, it's, it is re really interesting. I mean, last year we were, at, uh, when the pandemic hit, I was asked to provide house price forecasts and it was kind of, you know, forecasting is, is, a, is a, as an art as well as a science. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was impossible, but we were sort of saying, well, it could be minus five, minus 10%. Um, as you've seen, house prices ended the year up about eight and a half percent. This year, I am suspect you know we were always when the stamp duty holiday was uh, coming to an end we thought the market might call but with the government initiatives around the 95 percent and the stamp duty continuing we think that actually the market's going to be quite buoyant this year um, and i wouldn't be surprised i mean if house prices would head end the year on average and you know there's always uh, peaks and troughs around an average of about five percent so broadly similar not that much uh, different to to last year jeanette i've is this the first time that we've had such a house price boom, essentially, because that's what's happening in various bits of London against the background of a recession? I mean, this isn't a replay of the aftermath of the global financial crisis at all, is it? No, it's really, and it's really interesting because I was looking at a chart um, earlier today. And as you well know, if you plot GDP growth and you plot house price growth, they follow each other really starkly. So actually, if you look at what GDP has done over the last year, over a quarter, I mean, it went down by 18%, but it went up by 10%, and then it went down and it went up. And actually, it still follows. So, you know, if, if I was being a little bit facetious, I would say, well, actually, it has followed the trend. You know, when, when um, uh, GDP has fallen, I mean, we didn't see massive falls, but we saw the, the growth rate decline, and we've seen the growth rate go back up. So I think it kind of has followed trend. Um, but again, I suppose the really key point here is the fact that this is not a recession like any other recession. It's not an economic recession. You know, it's not because of some imbalance in the market. This is purely a public health related um, recession where the government has made the decision, forced into the decision, whatever your political view is, to actually shut the economy down. So it's not that there isn't demand, there's not that people don't want to buy property, it's not that, you know, I mean, I know there is the unemployment spectre there, but actually, you know, there was nothing wrong with our economy. So I think that's why it makes it different um, to all other recessions. Am I allowed to ask Jen another question? Because I'm really, <laughs> she's always got lots you of You can. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, this idea that we, people fortunate enough to stay in work have amassed all these savings during lockdown. What did they say? 180 billion of them. Do you believe those forecasts, a great chunk of that is going to go into property because homes have got a new value because we've all been stuck in our own four walls and they matter to us more than they ever did before? Yeah, I think that the large chunk of it, I was trying to look because I've got a post-it note somewhere. Someone told me a stat today that there's something ridiculous about how much people have got in cash ISAs at a 0.05%. Um, and it was something like 2 billion, but um, in, in cash ISAs. I definitely think that some of this money will go towards the housing market, but I think a large chunk is going to go on revenge spending. So, you know, I mean, my husband doesn't agree, but on the whole, there hasn't been a great deal of things to buy, you know, buy, you know, spend our money on over the recent times. And actually, as you know, we've saved up and people are just dying to go out. You know, I can't wait to go out for dinner. I can't wait to, you know, to go to a shop and buy some clothes that actually fit me. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of money spent in, in the hospitality, in hospitality, in hotels, which, of course, is great because this means this will regenerate, you know, the economy and, you know, we, we, cause we don't want our hospitality industry and leisure industry to be decimated. So I think that we will have a lot of um, spending on, on experiences and leisure, um, but, I, but I do agree there will be a portion and a chunk that will go towards housing because, you know, a lot of people have suffered through the pandemic. We've had people who have lived in very cramped conditions. We've had people who are living with their parents. Um, and I think people have said, right, actually, I know what I want now, whether it is a flat close to work or whether it is a, a bigger house with a garden. And so I think people have got that aim. And as you say, rightly say, they've got the money and the collateral. And of course, as Rachel will tell us, you know, the mortgage offers that we have out there um, are amazing at the moment. So I think all, you know, there are really positive headwinds. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that. And thank you, Anne, for asking questions. It's always good. Um, I have one final topic that I want to touch on because I think it's really important just before, before we move on, uh, which is the budget. So um, I know we've already mentioned just briefly the stamp duty holiday and the impact that that's had. Um, but on the budget as a whole, we all know it was really focused on health building at this time, which I think was really encouraging to see. Um, but what does it actually mean? What does it mean for, for buyers? What does it mean for investors? Uh, and what can we see coming next? And uh, I wonder if, Anne, actually, I can pass that on to you to start with. Uh, it was an extraordinary budget because I sat there, as we all sit now with our headphones on, thinking they really believe that the housing market will be the motor that helps the economy revive. And when we saw the mortgage guarantee scheme that's going to come through with 95% mortgages for that group that have struggled to get finance, the extension of the stamp duty holiday um, and the reiteration of that great aspiration to turn generation for an intergeneration by, and it all spoke to me of a government that really feels that the revival of the housing market and all the businesses that depend on it is crucial to getting the economy motoring again. And I think when people hear a budget like that, they feel confident about going to buy, they feel go confident about being able to go and somebody will say yes to them on a mortgage. And I'd love to hear what mortgage availability is like currently for, for first time buyers. But I'm just, also looking towards this new thing that they've got called tax day. Now, do we really need to have a tax day? I don't think so. But on the 23rd of March, the government is going to be unveiling its thinking or maybe even uh, concrete plans for what it's going to do on capital, capital gains tax and other taxes. And I just wonder whether a, a few landlords are thinking that maybe they'll be paying for the government largesse, the amount of billions that we've had to uh, spend as a as a government to get the uh, get people through this, whether there will be higher taxes on certain groups, and one of them could be landlords through capital gains tax. And I'd be very interested to know what everybody else expects from that day, tax day on March the twenty third, coming up pretty soon. Well, Mark, I think I'll hand over straight to you because I could see you nodding along there. I, I, I think this tax day is fantastic. I, I think the first thing we should say, and let's be honest, um, overseas investors have had a fantastic run for a very, very long time. You could buy a property in London and pay zero tax for years. And frankly, that every other country who were doing that was, was paying, foreigners buying in their country were paying double tax than everybody else has. So I think we should be number one saying that what they've done is is make it even. And so non-UK non investors are now paying the same as I or you or anybody else would. And that's fair. And that is not our government stuffing overseas investors. Landlords, they are an easy target because it's a large asset. It's a large investment. You can't do anything with it. If you're going to hit them with a tax, it's the best one to do. It's just like death duties. And... Um, and those are two, and, and obviously pensions are the other one that's going to get a get a potential hit. But I think the thing the thing about property is is number one, if you have to pay tax on a gain, that's a nice thing to do. No one likes paying tax, of course they don't. But we all like it when we go to the hospital and don't have to pay to see a doctor. But you know, we live in a welfare society, and we and people should pay tax. The truth is, if you make if you buy a flat and and as, as Ed said, in a generation scheme, when you buy in now at 300,000 and in 10 years time, it's worth 500,000 and you've got to pay 28% on that return, on that gain, come on, that's not unreasonable. Yes, no, of course, no one wants to pay it, but that's a gain. So you, should, you shouldn't be so upset about it. People get very, very focused. I mean, I speak to, I speak to lots of clients on a regular basis and all they do is moan about the tax they have to pay. But, you know, if you're a U.S. citizen living here, my God, they tax you on your worldwide income and, and, and you have to be fair. I think that landlords have to look out, but I don't, save for the capital gains, I don't see there's much more they can do. You pay it on your income you, with the rent, there's wear and tear was removed, interest, interest relief was removed. So actually all of that's evened up the playing field. So 
frankly, I'm in, I, I am properties. I buy, I, we, we as a business, we buy alongside our clients and, and actually I, I'm not selling anything. And, and a lot of clients have indicated they might, but actually when they come to it and you look at your, you know, when you look at the returns that you can make from owning a property, because let's be honest, if you go and buy equities, you pay this, you know, you still pay capital gains, still pay income tax, and you can't get finance. No one buys a portfolio of shares for 500,000 pounds and borrows 300,000 from the bank. Nobody does that. And so that's the thing you have to think about property. You've got, you're able to buy a property for much more than your cash sum. Yes, you have to pay taxes to go in. Yes, it, yes you do, but it gets washed quite quickly. You get finance on it at ridiculous rates at the moment. I mean, ridiculous rates. I mean, one and a half percent, two percent. I mean, it's it's nutty money. And if you're getting in the regeneration outer zones, if you're getting four, four and a half, five percent gross yields, I mean, there's positive cash flow there. Yes, there's service charging. Yes, there's tax. But people have to take that into account. So. You know, based on your cash investment with a buy to let loan, which I've got to say, I've never found it as easy as I've done as, as I find it at the moment. I think that still property investment is a obviously I'm an agent. So, of course, I think it's great. But but generally, I shouldn't be investing in property because I'm an agent, my whole income. But that's all I invest in is, is property. And I and I think long term, you know, let the, I tell you another great stat is that the um, PWC are predicting that by 2025, so in five years time, instead of 33% um, of people that rent in private accommodation, they reckon it's gonna be as much as 60%. That's a huge jump of people renting and they're your tenants. And, and, and we're seeing incredible demand at the moment. I mean, really incredible demand in the outer zones, you know, where Barrett have moved their focus to zones three zone, four zone, five, those outer zones, the rents we are achieving in, in Ed's scheme, like Eastman Village or Millbrook Park, the yields we've been getting is four and a half to 5% gross. You can't get that in prime central London and, and it's regeneration. And, and so that, that cash is there in order to make the thing run. So my view is, is you know, I still think property investment's a very good, strong thing. Maybe everybody yeah. agrees, but I do. No, I think that actually leads us quite nicely onto the next part of the the, um, the webinar, which is just to hear a little bit from Ed about the schemes that we have in London. So um, I'm just going to pass on over to Ed now, and he's going to put something up on the screen. Thank you, Alice. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, introduce the Barrett London portfolio. Um, uh, we have circa 12 developments currently uh, across um, the whole of London inside the M25, um, from Hayes Village in the east to uh, New, Car New Market Place and, and Upton Park in, in the west. Um, as you'll see uh, on the slide, uh, and as echoed by Mark a moment ago, the kind of gross rental yields that you can get across the portfolio of Barrett London product generally is between four to, to five percent, which is extremely healthy and, and compares very well to, to the inner zones of, of, of London. Um, clearly, there are a couple of sites that tip over the five percent, um, and obviously that's a very uh, healthy yield to, to achieve. Um, you'll notice that all of the developments and one of the key things that we've spoken about today is connect connectivity. You know, whenever we look at a piece of land, it's about how close that piece of land is to uh, the, the local station or the, the national rail station, because um, when you're looking to invest, you want strong rental demand in that area. And what people that are looking to rent are, are looking for an easy commute into central London. Um, you know, as everyone said, we will return to going back to offices and people, you know, want a 20, 30 minute commute maximum and probably, probably shorter than that. Um, I think some of the sites are, you know, on Crossrail and that's going to be a fantastic addition to um, the, uh, the London network and cut commuter times by, you know, in half if we ever actually get to, to travel on a train, but that's, that's another story. Um, you know, if you're looking to uh, invest in a, a Barrett London property, you know, I think there's a number, depending on what your motivations are for investing, there are a number of kind of key criteria that you would be looking for. You, you're probably looking for a strong kind of capital growth potential. And as we've spoken about, a lot of the developments are in regeneration areas. 
you, you'd be looking for strong rental demand. And, and as I say, uh, in regeneration areas, you, you see the young um, dynamic uh, people looking to rent in those particular areas. You, you, you're looking for um, no void costs and clearly where there's high uh, rental demand, uh, you mitigate that risk and really kind of a hassle-free investment. And that's where kind of Barrett London um, comes into its own. In terms of kind of showcasing a couple of our, our key developments, um, just like to focus on uh, Millbrook Park. Millbrook Park is located in the borough of um, Barnet. It's in, just by uh, Mill Hill East Station. It's one of our most popular developments and I'm sure Mark will, will underline the fact that I know he's done lots and lots of rentals there and, and achieved really good uh, rental values um, because of its proximity to Mill Hill East the, the Station and its short commute into central London. Um, Millbrook Park, our particular part of the uh, development is part of a consortium site where they're developing over 2000 units in total. And, you know, as we've spoken about in terms of region, it's not just about delivering new homes, it's about delivering new parks, a new primary school, a new commercial space with uh, a co-op um, superstore. So um, a real good opportunity to invest uh, and, and probably more importantly, a good opportunity with expect good expected kind of future capital growth uh, in Barnet uh, for the next kind of five years. Second, um, development I'd like to kind of showcase is New Market Place in East Ham. So we very much focused on kind of one in West and one in East. Um, again, really strong rental yields being achieved at New Market Place, uh, over 5%. Um, really one of the best investment opportunities for us in East London. Um, part of the, the kind of the new, new and regeneration area where 22 billion pounds is being invested uh, as a result uh, and in the wake of the 2012 uh, Olympics, so a real up and coming area. And again, the development is delivering not just new homes, but you know, um, facilities to go with it, such as you know, supermarkets, gyms, cafes, and retail space. And that's all really important to people uh, that are looking to rent uh, and investors looking to make sure that they um, are able to rent their properties quickly. One of the um, things that uh, you will be able to take um, part in as, as you've attended this webinar is uh, a special offer that we are running for the month of, month of March uh, in association with Market Benham. Um, it's a special offer that where we will guarantee that uh, you will achieve a 5% rent for the first year uh, on completion of your investment property. So we offer a full turnkey solution at Barrett London where you know, as Mark said, it's really important to furnish your property. We will include the furnishings as part of uh, the, the deal. Uh, so really all you need to do is collect your, collect your keys uh, and Benham and Reeves will take care of everything whereby they'll find you a tenant uh, and ensure that you have absolutely no void periods for the first 12 months because we guarantee that 5%. So that's- And you don't have to collect the keys actually. We've done that, the ones we've done. <laughs> yeah, well. exactly. You don't even have to come and see it. <laughs> you don't even have to come to see it. That's one way of investing, but I would advise you go and see your property that you're spending half a billion pounds on first. So that's a, that's a, a special offer that's available to um, anybody that's attending the webinar. Uh, as a result uh, of this webinar, one of, the, one of my team will uh, make contact with you to see, uh, to really understand what your requirements are uh, and what your investment goals are and to see whether we can help you uh, get on that investment journey. So um, all I, we do have other offers available. I know this is a kind of investor focused webinar, but um, clearly lots of people are purchasing um, using help to buy at the moment and our NHS uh, discounts. So if you do work for the NHS, you can um, get a, a discount from us. So um, yeah, or, or, or lots of opportunities to purchase with Barrett London. So thank you, Alice. Thanks, Ed. Um, so just a, we'll going through that as well as listening to Ed obviously I was uh, just going through your Q&A and seeing if I can if there are any questions that I can quickly pull out and um, hopefully we can just spend the last 15 minutes running through some of the um, conversations that have come up throughout the webinar. Um, so one question that's actually come up from a couple of people so I thought I'd touch on that first which is a query of whether one of bed properties as in smaller properties are still a good investment given a trend to home working and people perhaps looking for more space in their home uh, so I wonder if Mark actually that might be one for you to start with 
Okay, perfect. So 100% people are looking for more space. 100% people want to work from home. And therefore, the, we, we do surveys and we run them on tenants because actually finding out what tenants want is the most important thing in the rental process because, and developers, we give advice sometimes to developers, sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't, on, on where our surveys are. And actually fast broadband was always popular, but it's become in the top three of the most, most popular things that we get, we, the tenants want. Second thing is they want outside space. And those two factors are incredibly important. So yes, people want more space and they want a garden and they want, you know, people want as much as they can, but it's price driven and it's budget driven. So the reality is if you're getting a one bedroom flat because that's what you can afford to rent, you want to make sure there's outside space and fast broadband because if they work from home, they're gonna work within, with, within the unit. So they want to have, be able to open the windows or and walk around or, or to sit on their balcony or go out into the, if there's gardens. So frankly, one and two bedrooms are still very popular and we would still recommend those for investment. I mean, three bedroom pro properties in the, ha in, in the country house market are, and I'm sure Jen might talk about that, are, are a different thing because that's aiming at the family market. In the London market, we see the, big, the strongest demand is usually for between one and two bedroom flats. And the, the one thing I would add to that is one of the big factors that we've seen, it started obviously, we, we saw it starting to come in November last year was the arrival of BNO passport holders. So these are people coming from, sorry, BNO visa holders who are coming from Hong Kong with the concern on what China's gonna do. And we have had a 300% increase in inquiries via our Hong Kong office of people moving to the UK. This is not for investment. The interesting thing is we thought, oh my gosh, there's going to be a run on three and four bedroom properties. The reality is they're coming from the most tiny spaces ever in, in Hong Kong, you know, one bedroom flat with a family of four living in it. So when they come to London and they can rent a two bedroom, they're over the moon. So again, and, and a lot of them are renting, they ultimately will buy, but they're renting to try and see. So we're seeing incredibly strong demand for one and two bedrooms. They'll always be the, the most popular from a rental perspective. I'd add, Alice, I'd add to that. I said, if you can, depending on your budget, but if you can stretch to a two bed, it's always best to go to two bed, two bath, because clearly if you're renting the property out, then you absolutely need two, two bathrooms because people don't like sharing bathrooms. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, actually, probably staying with you, Ed, um, I suppose, although I, I'm sure there'll be other people on the call who would, who would like to answer this question, um, you mentioned briefly about Crossrail. I know that we have a uh, great development in Hayes, which is going to be on the Crossrail route. And one of the questions which has come up is why people might choose to still stay with a London location as opposed to going further out to one of the home, co home counties, for example, going somewhere in Slough or somewhere in Reading. And uh, what sprung to mind was obviously that Crossrail does still impact uh, the <laughs> outer London, London suburbs as well. But I wonder if um, there'd be any other, any other points of wisdom there you could add. Yeah, I, I, look, I, all I can say is we've seen massive demand, particularly at our Hayes development, which is uh, adjacent to you know Hayes and Harlington Crossrail station. Um, I think it comes down to, to personal preference and budget, really, depending on where you want to invest. Clearly, if you are looking at lower capital values, then you, you can uh, invest outside of the M25 on the Crossrail route. Uh, however, I would say that um, going back to kind of one of the key drivers when you're renting a property out is commuting times and even though commuting times on Crossrail will dramatically reduce you know to be able to get from somewhere like Hayes Village in West London to kind of Canary Wharf in you know 20 20 minutes 25 minutes is, is going to be phenomenal and you know there is only so far from from a rental uh, perspective that people are um, expected to commute and I would suggest that's only kind of half an hour for the majority of people so inside of London you still get really strong rental yields um, on the Crossrail route. Of course, there's other things you see that London offers that, that suburban towns don't. Now, I live in a suburban town, so I'm not knocking it. But, you know, it's particularly when you're a young professional, you're in your early 20s and, you know, late 20s, you've got the culture, there, you've got museums, you know, the theatre, all the pubs, pubs and clubs and things like that, you know. So there are, there's a lot that London offers that the outer areas don't offer. And it's a different demographic, you know, you would tend to get 
older people living out in the summer of some more younger people living in London. So I think, you know, th this trend that, that we, people say they're seeing, I don't think, you know, we need to read too much into it. Thank you, Jen. Um, so another question I've had through uh, is actually regarding help to buy. Um, but the, the, the question is that if you were to use help to buy to purchase the property, could you then choose to rent it out later? perhaps after having lived there for a couple of years. I wonder if there's anyone who can answer that. I'm happy to if you want. Unfortunately, um, if you're with the help to buy, you can't rent it out. You'd have to have bought the help to buy area out. So it's just part of the government scheme that you can't be renting it uh, whilst you're ut utilising that benefit, I'm afraid. So that's after five years, isn't it? So after yeah. five year, your five years is up, you then would have an option if you chose to. Yeah, you could buy out their share and then you could do as, as you wish and change it around. It's not after five years, Alice. It's you have to buy the government out of their share. So you basically have to repay, yeah, have to yeah, repay right. the repay the equity loan to the government. So you know the help to buy scheme is is really aimed and targeting at people that are, are struggling with affordability, getting on the property ladder. So and it's recently switched to being a first time buyer product only. So no, it's absolutely not relevant for investment purposes or you know buy to let properties. Brilliant. Thank you. And to be, and, um, and to be fair, can sorry, I add that? The, the thing is, if you're buying it for investment, you really don't want to have a 95% loan. <laughs> so let, let's be honest. I mean, I, I personally would, would, would never recommend anybody gets more than 70%. You know, while the yields are high, you do have service charges to pay. You do have tax on the income to pay. You do have potential voids. You do have tenants that sometimes touch wood. We have under 1% of tenants that don't pay, but, but can you imagine if you had at the beginning of lockdown, there were a lot of tenants who were struggling with knowing what to pay. So you need to have a buffer. So do not rush around. I mean, people that rush around and try to get 85% loan on a buy to let, I, I, I think they're nuts because that means you're constantly, almost every month, you're going to be sending money in to pay your mortgage. And, I, and, and it puts you under so much pressure because you get worried and you don't need that. So my advice, don't borrow more than 70 and certainly 95 percent. Wow. It's not, it just really possible. No. Well, I think that's a pretty, a pretty sturdy answer to that question. <laughs> so hopefully um, whoever, whoever asked it is now um, has a better answer for themselves and that um, um, can find a way forward. Um, so then just a quick question on the stamp duty holiday. And who it applies to. So we've had uh, two different questions. First being whether it would apply to investors and the second being whether it applies to second homeowners, so people who aren't first-time buyers. So it applies to all property purchases up to the, up to the value of £500,000. So uh, if you're buying a property for £500,000 and you can complete before the end of the stamp duty holiday, you'll save yourself £15,000 in stamp duty. It's as, it's as simple as that. Clearly, if you are... A second, you are purchasing a second home. You are going to pay a different level of stamp duty on if you're paying if you're buying a home for the first time. But um, ultimately, yes, it it's applicable to every house purchase. Perfect. I'm sure there'll be people who are very pleased to hear that. Um, so then, uh, a question for you, Rachel. Um, uh, the question is, can we get part finance, or do we need to give 100% cash for a purchase? I wonder if you can help. Yes, yeah, so you could um, raise a finance a mortgage to help buy the buy to let. As Mark was saying, then we would always advise around the 70%, no more than 75% really on financing and the rest on cash. Uh, that way, you've always got the buffer to cover the extra charges like service charge and rental voids. Great, thank you. Um, we're moving through these fairly quickly. <laughs> Uh, another question, um, I think one from, from Mark, uh, following your discussions on the tax uh, situation for landlords, um, the question was whether the tax on landlords will decrease profitability so and what impact that would have. What was, sorry, you cut out, what did you say? Sorry, yeah. whether the tax on landlords would decrease profitability. Um, so from a property investment perspective, whether it's worth it, I guess. So. I mean, I refer back to what I said before. Yes, there is tax to pay. And yes, that will reduce the net return that you get. But the beauty with property is you are getting a yield, which is pretty much guaranteed. And with about 5% guarantee, which actually Ben and Marie's are picking the hit up on, 
if I can't let it, I pay the money out of my own pocket. So I wouldn't be doing that if I genuinely didn't think that we were going to be able to let these flats. So number one, there will be rental income for you. Number two, if you buy in a regeneration area and with everybody getting excited, whether it's between 5% this year, but even if it's 5% every year for the next five years, and that's 25, 30% over that period, you've got a capital gain there. There's the two things. So there is a return on it. No, maybe it's, maybe it's muted compared to what's happened over the last 10 years, but a property investment should not be a quick in and out next year. You cannot People that still focus on wanting to buy today and sell tomorrow or flip it before completion and all of the things that people talk about, because I, a number of dinner parties I used to go to when they used to have them and people would say, oh, you're so lucky as an agent, you must be able to buy stuff and sell it before it's even completed, make a fortune. It doesn't exist now. So people need to take a five to 10 year focus. And that is, you will then make a good return and you will make a very good stable return. I mean, one of the things I always say to investors and one of my bits of it really, I think this is really important is if you buy a property today and you pay 300,000 for it, you, when do you look at that value? When do you next think how, what's it worth? You look generally, most people look at it when they do a revaluation for their mortgage. They like to think their property prices have go up a little bit, but you don't look. If you buy shares, 95% of shareholders who own shares, whether you own five pounds worth of BP or a million pounds worth of Barrett, like Ed does, um, then um, um, you will look at your shares every day. And so it's a very, very, you, you, you know, it's almost like a stress involved with owning equities, whereas you own property, it's solid. The only thing you're worrying about is your income comes in, you pay your loan and your service charge, and you have a little buffer, and you pay the tax on the balance of your income, and your capital gain comes in the long term. It's a lovely, passive, long-term investment. And I think it's one, it's one of the most stable. And if you look at the richest people in the UK, long-term, Duke of Westminster, you know, all of the major estates in London, that capital and that wealth has been generated from property ownership. And that is ultimately why to buy and buy in London as a market is as I, I use the phrase, London is bulletproof as an investment. I think it's pretty, you know, when, whenever you've bought, if you hold it for five to 10 years, it's pretty difficult to lose money. It's, it, you, you'd really have to do something terrifyingly badly. Even if you bought in a building which had cladding issues, even if you bought in a cladding issue prop property, which lots of people have been worried about, this is gonna be resolved. And once it's resolved, then that will, all, that will be out of the way when they start issuing the form. So I, 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 I still believe it's a very, very strong, and the returns are still going to be as, in the longer term, it all evens out. You know, and I think it's a good long-term investment. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I've, I've had one uh, other question through with, about whether there are any offers available um, to different people um, across the country. Um, uh, the question in particular was around teachers, uh, which I think uh, my understanding is I don't believe we have any specific um, offers available at the minute. However, Ed, just for everyone else's uh, benefit, I wondered if you could just touch on the other um, offers and deposit contribution schemes that we have available. Yeah, so we, we have a plethora of different schemes that depending upon your circumstances and your motivations for buying uh, and what deposit you have, we can help you get on the property ladder. So all I would say is, you know, it's, it's too, it, it would take me a long time to go through all the schemes this, this evening. All I would say is, is make contact with us. And, you know, if you've got a 5% deposit, then ultimately we can get you on the property ladder with, with one of our schemes. Um, I referenced the NHS scheme particularly because obviously that was that's something that we promoted as a result of you know the, uh, the last 12 months. Um, but there are there are many other schemes that we have that we could, that depending on, on what you require, whether it be furnishings or whether it be help with a deposit or whether it be contribution to stamp duty. There's many other schemes available to help you get on the property ladder. Perfect. Well, I think. We are drawing to an end. It is 6.59 and without wanting to bleed into anyone's evening uh, any further, um, 
I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. So uh, I just want to say thank you again for everyone who has joined, everyone who has asked a question. Um, I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to everybody's questions, uh, weren't able to answer them all today. Uh, however, we will be adding all of the questions uh, to our website with answers um, and the web page will be circulated. But just for everyone's reference, it is um, barrettlondon.com forward slash investor webinar. And that will be available by the weekend. So please do check in on that. Um, also, just a, a massive thank you to all our panellists. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, thank you to Ed and Barrett London, obviously, for organising this webinar. I hope that everyone's found it um, useful. I certainly found it really interesting. <laughs> and um, so thank you again, everyone. And I uh, hope to see everyone soon. Thanks, Alice. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.